John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. This is grace. And when you've turned to that, let's pray. Our great God and Father, we dare to ask you now, magnify your glorious Son before our eyes through your Word and in the power of your Spirit. And so magnify your Son now that we might fear Him above all things, that we might rejoice in Him above all things, that we might fear Him more than anything else, that we might glory in Him before anything else, that we might make Him our only boast. And we pray these things, our Father, in Jesus' marvelous name. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It is often the case that familiar sentences are familiar because of how powerful or world-changing they have been. They are familiar because of how defining they are. And so it is here in John 1. These familiar words, they're revolutionary. They set Christianity gloriously apart from every other belief system. And yet, Really, John is simply exegeting Genesis 1. There, in the very beginning, in Genesis 1, we see how the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And why was he doing that? Why? Well, for the same reason he later hovered over the waters of the Jordan, of the baptism of Jesus, the Spirit was there to anoint the Word as He went out to do His work. And so in creation and in salvation, in creation and in new creation, the Spirit anoints the Word and so God speaks, and on His divine breath, His Word goes out. His Word goes out, and light and life and all creation are brought into being. Not Himself a creature, a created being. For you, you see, it's not that in the beginning the Word came into existence. Verse 3, the creation came into existence. That's not how John speaks. No, here is a Word who was with God and who was God. Now, just that. 
tells you something that is quite unique, extraordinary, and simply delightful about this God. For we are not hearing here simply that God happens to speak. The gods of many world religions are said to speak at some point. That's not the big deal. That's not the claim. No, this is quite a different claim. It is of the very nature of this God to have a word to speak. This God cannot be wordless. For the word is God. And think what that means. Here then is a God who could not ever be anything but communicative. He cannot be without his word. Here is a God who could not be anything but expansive, outgoing, Since God cannot be without this word, here is a God who cannot be reclusive. For eternity, this word sounds out, telling us of an uncontainable God. A God of exuberance, of superabundance. An overflowing God, not needy, but supremely full, overflowing, a glorious God of grace. Here is a God who loves to give himself. Now, clearly, it is Genesis 1 that is dominant in John's mind as he wrote these opening verses. Have a look. In the beginning, the light shines in the darkness. And that helps you to see that when John writes here, he has a Hebrew scriptural idea of what the word means. This is not a Hellenistic import on the faith. But to appreciate a little more deeply what John meant when he wrote of the Word, it's worth seeing something else from the Old Testament that seems to have been on his mind. Genesis 1 is dominant, but have a look at verse 14. John writes that, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Now, as you no doubt know, John chooses a quite unusual verb here to express what he means. More literally, he writes that the word tented, pitched his tent among us. And with this mention of glory here, it seems tent and glory, it seems clear John is thinking of the tabernacle, the tent where the Lord would come and be with his people, with his people in the wilderness and where his glory would be seen. And so, as the Israelites saw the bright glory cloud filling the tabernacle, so the Word is where we see the glory of God. Yes, there. So surprising in the humility of that one who became flesh and dwelt among us in the humility of that one who had no pillow, in the humility, the grace, the righteousness, the the gentleness, the faithfulness, 
the compassion of that one who went all the way to the cross. And there we saw his glory, a glory unlike the glory of any other. Now, in the innermost part of the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, the Lord was described as being enthroned between the cherubim of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. That's uh, 1 Samuel 4.4, 4, Leviticus 16.2. And inside that gold-plated Ark throne of the Lord were kept the two tablets of the law on which were written the ten words, the ten commandments, the word of God. And for the Israelites, it was part of what modeled the truth that the word of God belongs in the very presence, in the very throne of God. The Word of God, John is saying, is the one who belongs in the deepest, most essential closeness with God, and the one who displays the innermost reality of who God is. He is, Hebrews 1.3, the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of of his being, for he is God himself. He is, Revelation 3.14, God's Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation. Now, this was the subject that was the topic for perhaps the greatest battle that the church fought in the centuries after the New Testament. They had to defend many things. They had to defend the humanity of Christ. But perhaps the greatest battle was to uphold belief that Jesus truly is God, none other than the Lord God of Israel himself, that he is, as was enshrined in those stirring words of the Nicene Creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. And those doctrinal words are pastoral dynamite. The great Puritan theologian John Owen saw this with great clarity in his wonderful work, Communion with God. Owen explained in the first third of that book how so many Christians labor under the misapprehension that behind gracious Jesus, the friend of sinners, there is some more sinister being, one who is thinner on compassion and grace, thinner on beauty, goodness one we would less like to know. And Owen pointed out, since Jesus is this word, we can be rid of that horrid idea. And so he spoke of the word as being the beam from the Son of the Father's being, showing us what the Father is like, the radiance of his being, for there is no God in heaven who is unlike Jesus. One with his Father, he is the Word, he is the imprint, he is the expression, he is the radiance, an outgoing radiance. He is the glory of who his Father is, so that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. And that means that through Christ, 
I can know what God is truly like. And that upsets all my idols. Through Christ, I see how much this God detests sin. And through Christ, I see that like the sinful dying thief, a sinner like me can cry, remember me. For I know how he'll react. And though I'm so spiritually lame, leprous, diseased, and dirty, I've seen how he's treated such. I know just what he's like towards people like me, righteous and gracious. Another great Puritan preacher, Stephen Charnock, once wrote this in his description of God in the doctrine of God. Charnock wrote this. He said, Is not God the Father of lights, the supreme truth, the most delectable object? Is he not light without darkness, love without unkindness, goodness without evil, purity without filth, all excellency to please, without a spot to distaste, are not all other things, asked Charnock, infinitely short of him, more below him than a cab of dung is below the glory of the sun. Now, is that not a delight we want in God for ourselves and in every other believer? And so, how is it that Charnock could be so besotted with God, so delighted, so in awe, so enraptured? Because you, you hear in that description, here's a man who went through the gales and storms of life, and he seems to carry this core of sunshine with him in his knowledge of God. So whence such gladness? Charnock could not have been plainer. He said, true knowledge of the living God is found in and through Christ. But what we find in Christ is so beautiful, so transforming, it can make the sad sing for joy and the dead spring to life. And so Charnock wrote, nothing of God looks terrible in Christ to a believer, terrible to a non-believer. But nothing of God looks terrible in Christ to a believer. The sun is risen. Shadows have vanished. God walks upon the battlements of love. Justice has left its sting in a Savior's side. The law is disarmed, weapons out of its hand. His bosom is open, his bowels yearn, his heart pants. Sweetness and love is in all his carriage. And this is life eternal, to know God believingly in the glories of his mercy and his justice in Jesus Christ. And so in Jesus Christ, you exchange darkness for light when you think of God, because He shows us against all the idols of human religion, He shows us, the Word shows us, an unsurpassably full and desirable God, a righteous and a kind God, a God who makes us tremble in awe and rejoice in wonder. And I see another great pastoral benefit from verse 3. All things were made through Him 
Without him was not anything made that was made. Christ, the eternal word, is the one through whom all things were made. But secular thinking in the West has eaten away at belief in this like acid in the church. And it's left many Christians with the sneaking suspicion that while Jesus may be a savior, he's not really the creator of all. Meaning, practically, they will sing of his love on a Sunday, and there they genuinely believe it's true. But walking home through the streets, past the people having their lives, past real life, and they don't feel this is all Christ's world. As if the universe is a neutral place. As if it's a secular place, essentially. As if Christianity is something you can simply smear on top of secular, real life. And the result is Jesus gets reduced to being little more than a comforting nibble of spiritual chocolate. An option alongside other hobbies. An imaginary friend. The Bible knows of no such piffling and laughable little Christlet. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And therefore Christians are not playing at a hobby that we can put on one side when we walk out into the world. No, Jesus Christ is the one through whom all things came, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. He is the Word, the agent of creation, who continues each moment to uphold and sustain the creation He brought into being. All things from the tiniest little sea urchin to the brightest star, all things bear his stamp. The heavens cannot but declare his glory, for they are his craftsmanship, and they continue to exist. They continue to move only in him. In fact, his character is so intimately written into the very grain of the universe he created that even to think against Christ the Logos, you must think against logic and therefore descend into folly, which is why Psalm 14 says, it is the fool who says in his heart, there is no God. In his world, all our faculties work better the more they are harnessed to faith in him. Then we are able to be more logical, more vibrant, more imaginative, more creative, because trusting in him, we are working with the nap of the universe as he created it. We are the ones working with the grain when we have faith in him. Christ, the glorious eternal word, the radiance of his Father's being. But there is another eternal title of Christ that starts creeping into John's prologue here. Now, in these first few verses, it is the Word, that title, the Word, that John focuses on. But hear the shift. 
Here's the shift, particularly from verse 12, you see it. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How so? Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. For as well as being God's eternal word, this one is also God's eternal Son. And just in those titles, you can feel some of the difference in what they mean. Word is a title that speaks more of his oneness with God, the fact that he is God. Son brings out the other sweet truth, that this one has a real relationship with God his Father. And once again, you see, we've got something against every other belief system in the world, and infinitely superior, that no human mind has ever dreamed of. John is saying that God is eternally a father who has, who loves his son. The, the spirit he, he will teach in a bit. And so later in John 17, 24, we'll read Jesus saying, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. And so where at bottom every other belief system in history has had either fundamental nothingness or fundamental chaos out of which everything has come, or else, for some reason we're usually not told, a god exists somehow, or gods exist somehow, and they like throwing their weight around. They want servants or they want friends, so they create. But here at bottom, before anything, we do not see that. We do not see that underneath everything is fundamental nothingness, underneath everything is fundamental chaos, or a god or gods exercising arbitrary power. Here we see an almighty God who is love. In his first epistle, John would write that God is love. For this God would not be who he is if he did not love. If at any time the father had not had this son whom he loved, he simply would not be a father. To be who he is then, this God must love, give out. To be the Father means to love, to beget the Son. Now, the eternal Sonship of Christ is such a precious truth to Christians. And why that should be was proven well by Arius in the fourth century when he denied it. And he proved why it was important very well. You see, as Arius saw it, there once was a time when the sun was not. Catchy, isn't it? And Arius was a brilliant publicist. He had choirs sing his theology. There once was a time when the sun was not. He had choirs sing it in pretty ditties. He even set up a magazine called The Watchtower to spread the news. <laughs> But here, 
Here is how Arius saw God. See, as Arius saw it, it's obvious that God would not want to dirty his hands with creation. And so God created the Son to do the dirty work for him. Now, there's some important fallout from that. First of all, it means God is not eternally a father, if that is the case, since he doesn't eternally have a son. In fact, since he just created this thing, he's not really a father at all. Oops. There's the primary comfort of the Lord's Prayer gone up in a puff of philosophy. And second, for Arius, it was not that the father truly loved the son. The son was just his hired workman. And if the Bible ever spoke of the father's pleasure in the son, it can only have been because the son had done a good job. And that, presumably, is how to get in with Arius God. See what's happened? No eternal son, no fatherly God, no gospel of grace. You'll have to earn it with him. There was also, for Arius, the problem of the son's own motivation. Have Philippians 2 in your head. But then imagine. Imagine the son was a creature, a creature who had never sat on the heavenly throne at the right hand of God. Imagine that. Now, why would this creature go through Philippians 2? Why would he humble himself from some sort of exalted, semi-divine, angelic status in heaven? Why would he humble himself down, down, down to the cross? What's his motivation at the end to where he's going? What is it that he wants where he's going? His motivation must be that God would exalt him to a heavenly glory he had never known before. He's doing it for himself. Only with the eternal Son that cannot be. With the eternal Son, God is not using him as hired help, and he's not using God to get heavenly glory. He's eternally been at the Father's side. He is the eternally beloved. His motivation was not to get a glory he had never had before, but to share with us what he himself had always enjoyed, sonship. To come to us and bring us in him back to the exalted position he'd always enjoyed before his father. And so, this is coming on to verse 12 now, who he is, who he is entirely shapes what it is that he offers in the gospel. The person of Christ shapes the work of Christ and the nature of the gospel of Christ entirely. For the eternally beloved Son comes to us to share with us the very love that the Father has always lavished on Him. He comes to us to bring us into the life that is His, that we might be brought before the Most High. That we sinners might be brought before the Most High and not just as forgiven, not just as righteous, as dearly beloved children in the Son, sharing by the Spirit the Son's own Abba cry. And so the Father's eternal love for the Son can encompass us. This is verse 12. To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, the Son gave the right to become children of God. 
And this is a theme that then gets woven through the rest of John's gospel. You see in verse 18, the Son is presented as being eternally, well, in the NASB or the ESV footnote, in the bosom of the Father or lap of the Father. In that closeness, later on in John 17, 24, Jesus declares that his desire is that believers might be with him where he is. And that gets modeled for us at the Last Supper. In John 13, you can turn to it. In John 13, we read that one of his disciples, verse 23, One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus, or I have the ESV in the footnote, in the bosom of Jesus. Jesus, who's eternally been in the bosom of the Father, and John is now in the bosom of Jesus, which is why Jesus can say to the Father in John 17, 23, Father, you have loved them even as you've loved me. for the greatest privilege of the gospel, capping off our election, our calling, our forgiveness, our being clothed in righteousness, shaping our sanctification, shaping our glorification, is that the Son shares with us His own Sonship that we might be known as the children of God. Now, friends, without the eternal Son, you don't get that gospel. No eternal Son, no sonship. No eternal Son, no eternal Father. And if God's not a Father, He couldn't give us the right to be His children. If he didn't enjoy eternal fellowship with his son, does he know what fellowship is? Does he have any fellowship to share with us? Of course not. If the son had been a creature, hadn't been eternally in the bosom of the father, if he hadn't known closeness with his father, how could he share any closeness with us? What sort of relationship with the father could he bring to us? If the Son had never been close, He could not bring us to that children of God relationship. And so, with no eternal Son, we see God would be loveless and salvation would look entirely different. Distant hirelings, we'd remain. Never to hear the Son's word to to his Father, John 17, 23. Father, you've loved them even as you've loved me. But the gospel of the eternal Son gives us an intimacy, a confidence with the Most High. Beloved children of the Most High, there is no other God who can do that to bring us so close, to have us so loved, to give us such an exalted status. No other God would so win our hearts then. With this God only, we can say with all sincerity, our Father knowing that we pray, as John Calvin would put it, as it were, through the mouth of Jesus, the firstborn. And the Most High delights to hear us as His children, our prayers as sweet-smelling incense before Him. The Eternal Son then enables a hearty, delighted prayer life. 
with this God, prayer becomes a privilege, a delightful privilege. And once again, it means you've got a salvation that is of grace from first to last. Because if salvation is not about being adopted into the family of the Father, it's just not so clear that it has to be entirely of grace. We, we sometimes speak as if our only problem before God is that God is perfect in holiness and we are not. And if that is our only problem, you know what we're like. If we think our standards aren't high enough, we'll have another go. We'll try and sort ourselves out and do better. But if salvation is to be adopted as children into the Father's family, our performance is just not going to work because you cannot earn your way into a family. God's blessing is sonship, verse 12, becoming a child of God. And so effort can have nothing to do with it. Your efforts can make you a slave. No amount of effort can make you a son. All our efforts to win God's salvation by our own strength will only produce slaves. But sonship is free. Now, 500 years ago, the neglect of the eternal Son and how His person and being shapes the gospel was at the very heart of the problem in the church. The person of Jesus Christ, the eternal Word and Son, His identity did not shape and drive the gospel as people heard it. In medieval Roman Catholicism, Christ was only the delivery boy who brought us the grace we really wanted, grace like spiritual Red Bull for the lazy was the thing we really wanted to give us the energy to go out and do the holy things that would make God say, this one merits heaven. That's what we were after, grace, this thing. And the prize was so often heaven, not Christ. And so, Jesus Christ had been reduced to being one little brick in the wall of that system. And to be honest, it didn't even have to be him who'd won the grace in the first place. St. Nicholas or St. Barbara or St. Someone could have done it. And they did help. And then, in the Reformation, the world heard a profoundly Christ-centered message that God does not give us some thing called grace to energize us to earn heaven. No, God gives His Son, His Word who became flesh, and from His fullness we receive grace upon grace. The eternal Son he is the gift from heaven. And to all who, verse 12, receive Him. Now this thing called grace, to all who receive Him, He gave the right to become children of God. It is in Him we find ourselves clothed with righteousness and justified. In Him, the Son, we are adopted as the children of God. And in Him we are therefore saved and because we're in Him, kept to the uttermost. In Reformation thought, Christ is the treasure. Christ is our security. 
in Reformation thought, Christ is the jewel and the cornerstone of the gospel, giving it its shape and giving us a comfort and a joy that no gospel without him could match. In Reformation thought, Solus Christus was the center of the solas. For it shaped what the reformers meant when they talked about grace and faith. When the reformers talked about salvation by grace alone, they meant not that we're given this thing called grace, we're given Christ by the grace of God, the kindness of God. And faith is not something we do, it is the empty hand that receives Christ. Scripture, our supreme authority, our deepest foundation is about Him. And if you would know how to give God alone the glory, you exalt Jesus Christ. You magnify Him. For only through Christ is the living God glorified. Brothers, preach Christ, Christ alone, the eternal Word, the eternal Son, for there is no gospel without Him. You can speak of grace, you can speak of faith, you can speak of hope, you can speak of the gospel, you can speak of grace alone. There is no gospel if you do not preach Christ alone. This is the center we must hold fast to and pledge ourselves to. And since we see in Him the radiance of the glory of God, what better center is there to pledge ourselves to in all our preaching? We preach Christ, Christ alone. We preach Him to ourselves, to His people, to the world. We preach His glorious person and His all-sufficient work. And that is what honors the Reformation. That is the beginning of all Reformation. This is what will reform lives and reform the church in our day. For when Christ alone is faithfully preached, the world will see His glory, and that is the only light that will drive out and overcome all darkness. Let's pray. Father, help us, we pray, to magnify not ourselves or anything other than Christ. May we make Him our boast, Him the center of our gospel. May Jesus Christ shape and define the good news we proclaim to the world. And so, as He is lifted up, May we see many drawn to him and the darkness driven away by the light of his glory. In his name we boldly pray. Amen.